Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. A while back, I put out a call asking if anyone was interested in being a guest host for an episode of Classical Ideas. This is one of those episodes, and I am absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Brian Carwana to the interviewer's chair for this episode. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Carwana, and I'm your guest host for this episode. Before I introduce our guest, I thought I'd better introduce myself. Uh, I have a PhD in religion from the University of Toronto, and I'm the executive director of a really unique center that teaches religious literacy called Encounter World Religions that is based near Toronto. Encounter promotes religious literacy primarily to three major groups, schools, workplaces, and the general public. For schools, I speak to classrooms and at teacher training events, uh, much of it done virtually nowadays. For workplaces, I teach about religious diversity and inclusion, and I've done this with police officers and healthcare workers, municipalities uh, and corporations. And for the general public, we offer discovery programs. Our premier event, the highlight of my year every year when there's not a pandemic, uh, is our Discovery Week, where we explore 11 religions in one really rich week in Toronto. It's a tremendous learning experience that combines introductory classes to all 11 religions with about 20 site visits to religious spaces. Uh, Toronto has large and spectacular houses of worship. So we go there, uh, we, I often time it so that we observe ritual. We meet community leaders, imams, rabbis, Rasta elders, Wiccan priestesses, Zoroastrians. We explore architecture and sometimes we share a meal. It's a real feast for the senses. Uh, I won't be doing one this year because of the pandemic, but we do offer shorter versions, and I probably will do a shorter version in October, kind of post-vaccine. I've also now started offering online versions that are even more accessible. I don't have a date as of the time of this recording, but probably by the time it's posted, we'll have a date up. It's li likely to be in June. Uh, oh, and by the way, if you're a university professor, I have customized these. I've often had university professors bring a group and I can design a four or six day program if that interests you. Uh, so you can check any of that out at Encounter World Religions and look up the discovery programs. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is I do have a personal site and that is at religionsgeek.com. And at religionsgeek.com, I do highlight these events, but I also, it's there that I have my blog and I blog about religion every week. And if you sign up for the newsletter, you get the blog every week along with, I always find about two stories on religions that I find really interesting. Uh, so you can check that out at religionsgeek.com. And that's also my Twitter handle, uh, at religionsgeek. Okay, uh, that's enough about me. Now on to this week's guest. Our guest today is Donovan Schaefer. Uh, Donovan is an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He also taught at Oxford for a few years and is a leading theorist on affect theory. And we'll talk about what that is. His key book is uh, Religious Affects, Animality, Evolution and Power, in which he challenged the notion that religion is mostly about language and belief and emphasized instead that it's driven by affects. Uh, and a personal note here, when I read Donovan's book several years ago, it uh, it 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 solved problems I was having with academia uh, and dramatically sort of affected my own trajectory and played a big role in my dissertation. So it's, it's a personal pleasure to have Donovan here. Thanks for being with us, Donovan. Thanks for having me, Brian. Uh, Donovan, I don't know how many books I read for my PhD, 100 or 150 or whatever it was. Um, all of them started the same way except yours. All of them started by talking about people. But when I opened your book, uh, it wasn't people. There were apes and a waterfall. Uh, so Donovan, can you describe what is that setting and why are we talking about apes and a waterfall? Sure, yeah. Um, so I uh, started the book with a scene that is described by a number of different primatologists and Jane Goodall uh, included. They, they all kind of describe it in slightly different ways. Um, but what they are interested in is this phenomenon where uh, chimpanzees um, as they are traveling, um, will sometimes encounter a waterfall. And when they encounter waterfalls, they have a tendency to react to the waterfall in very dramatic ways. So Jane Goodall famously calls this a dance. Um, 
this sort of vocabulary of dancing has been used by a few other primatologists as well. Um, it seems to involve a lot of charging around, a lot of what they call um, display behavior, which means uh, the, uh, the physical expressions that they would express uh, when they encounter um, another group of chimpanzees, a rival group of chimpanzees. Um, they grab onto vines, they swing through the, uh, through the waterfall, um, and it's just, it's just the scene of excitement. And it's a puzzle. And the primatologists don't really understand what's happening. Um, Jane Goodall famously uh, makes this argument that it's an illustration of what she calls primate spirituality. And I decided to open the book with this. Hmm. Uh, and, and why? What were you trying to do? Why did you start with animals? What was the point of that? Yeah, I mean, why start with animals? I guess, uh, you know, like you, I was thinking about this book as a way of responding to problems that I was encountering in the academic humanities. And one of the problems that I felt like I kept bumping up against was there was this sense that what makes humans what they are um, distinguishes us from animals in very dramatic ways. So this idea that humans have reason or humans have language, and this makes us into something that is fundamentally different from other animal organisms, including the uh, animals that were most closely related to the, uh, the great ape species. Um, and I just became more and more convinced the more I encountered this line of thinking that it was missing something. And that if we wanted to understand the way that we are as human beings in society, um, to understand human politics, um, to understand uh, even things like human religion, we needed to see ourselves as in continuity with other animals. Now that doesn't mean that we're the same as other animals, but it does mean that we're in continuity with them. And to me, this uh, example of the chimpanzees responding to waterfalls um, was a, a sort of prism that we could use to think about religion in a way that was connected to other animals rather than as something that was fundamentally separate from the animal world that we come from. Hmm. And can I ask you, I remember talking with a friend of mine, a female academic, and she, uh, we had this discussion about whether you were being um, deliberately provocative with the imagery of the apes, that is, you know, overstating to make a point or, or know whether it was more look, there is, you know, not provocative, but it's, there's something real here. Is yeah, that that's a, a good question. question. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I was being provocative. I mean, I think that if we don't have an understanding of where religion comes from that pays attention to our bodies, and I think that paying attention to animals is a great way of thinking about our bodies, then we are missing something. Um, and it seemed to me that a lot of the perspectives that we use um, to think about religion. You know, there's a lot of talk about the body, but a lot of these perspectives still ultimately come back to this idea that religion is basically about ideas. It's basically about words and beliefs and propositions, and that all of these uh, words and beliefs can be um, clumped together into something that's called a religion. And what I wanted to do was suggest that if we want to understand religion as something that really meaningfully comes from bodies, we need to see it as something that is not hooked to language. Religion doesn't have to be something that um, is, is irrevocably connected to language and belief. And to me, that's, that's what the example of animals um, helps us to tap into. That doesn't mean that language isn't important. It just means that language isn't the be all and end all. Um, so in that sense, yes, I mean, it was provocative, but I, I don't think that it was. Um, but there's substance there. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And in the book you talk about, and you've started to allude to this, you're, you're pushing back against what you call the linguistic turn in academia. What, what is a linguistic turn? Yeah, so the linguistic turn is sort of a, a kind of loose um, designator that we use uh, in theory circles to talk about a shift in focus, in particular over the past few generations um, within the humanities, 
uh, towards seeing language as something that is foundational for human subjectivity. So this has a lot of different roots. You could uh, talk about it as coming from post-structuralism. You could talk about it as coming from structuralism. Um, it's, uh, you could talk about it as coming from certain strands of Marxist thought, uh, all of these different perspectives that make language into the central feature that organizes human subjectivity. Um, and that is partly what I, I was trying to offer an alternative to, this idea that um, everything that plays out within the sphere of religion and within human subjectivity more generally really has its foundations in language. And I remember uh, one of the things I liked your book was I was struggling at the time with uh, how much social construction was kind of emphasized in academia. And you, you use different language. You talked about assemblage. What did you mean by assemblage? Yeah, I mean, I think social construction is a very important paradigm to have in front of us um, when we're doing work inside the humanities um, because it's, it's very powerful. It helps to explain a lot of what's around us. However, I also think that there is a there's a moment where social constructionism becomes a kind of all determining explanatory framework and everything becomes constructed. And there's a way in which that too ends up forgetting bodies. It ends up forgetting materiality. So this is related to the linguistic turn because often social constructionist approaches rely on language to explain how the social is being made. Um, but that's not necessarily the only way to be a social constructionist. Um, but I would say that I think a more nuanced approach takes social construction very seriously, but also tries to engage in conversations with biology and with psychology that don't necessarily have this strong social constructionist perspective. And the, and the assemblage of the idea is that there are some pieces that are um, have some stability or I think you say intransigence, is that right? Like th that there's limits to how, how malleable life is. Is that, am I saying that right? Absolutely, yeah. So one of the arguments that I make in the book is that we need to see some elements of our social psychological life as having a biological foundation. Now for psychologists, that's a totally uncontroversial thing to say. But there are a lot of places within the humanities where a statement like that would provoke an allergic reaction and yeah. would immediately be met with a kind of um, a sort of wall of refusal. And to me, that's overstated. We need to find a way to bring these perspectives together. So I talked about this in terms of emotions. I think that we need to be able to use vocabulary of uh, the different emotions um, in a way that meaningfully recognizes that they are held in common by bodies, by various human bodies, but also by um, the bodies of other animals, especially animals that are evolutionary more uh, uh, evolutionary close, evolutionarily closer to us. Um, so that's that's sort of what I was trying to get at. We need to think about these different elements as present, but also able to be reconfigured by the social. So would I be right to say, like, instead of thinking of life as clay that you can mold endlessly, it's more like Lego. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that sort of works. I like that a lot. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's really nicely put. Okay, so you've so got the constructive dimension because the Lego bricks get moved around, but what is getting moved around is not necessarily constructed in this classical sense. Right, and if you don't have curved pieces, making a really nice circle is gonna be hard. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, can, so can you give us examples? Um, I'm thinking of religious practices. Are there religious practices that, you know, this, you can put them in different social contexts, but they're gonna have somewhat enduring or recognizable impacts? Is there, can you give us a practical example, a real world one? Yeah, it's a great question. So meditation, what's meditation? Does meditation have particular emotional effects that cross cultures? Does uh, certain physical bodily practices, are they, do they only do what we, what we are told 
they should do? Or is there a way in which if these practices migrate across cultures, we can see commonalities? Um, my sense is that we see commonalities and we see differences. And that's this hybrid approach. We, we, we do see that there is a kind of construct, a cultural construct that follows these practices around. But there is also this set of intransigent elements that come along with something like a rigid meditative discipline that shape our emotions. And that's not necessarily something that is totally culturally determined. Yeah, that's good. Okay. And I was thinking if we leave, uh, left the religious world, I was even thinking like PTSD, right? Like you might not have the language for it, but there's, there's something cross-cultural about that essentially. That's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, all right. So Donovan, at the intro, I said that you're an affect theorist. I think it's time for us to dive into the heart of it. What, what is affect? Yeah, that's the question. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a complicated question because affect theory is as a field internally very multiple. Like there are a lot of different people who are using this concept of affect and sometimes using it in different ways. And I actually find when I start talking about affect theory, um, you know, there's, there's a whole contingent of people whose eyes just kind of glaze over. Um, and I think part of it is because the way that affect gets used in these divergent ways um, has produced a kind of uh, has produced a kind of cipher, and you sort of need to know how to navigate your way into the conversation by recognizing how different scholars within the conversation are using this word in different ways. So, just as a very brief overview, um, I would say the main way that people use the word affect um, is in a sense that is informed by the philosopher uh, Benedict Spinoza, um, who says that we are affected by the world around us. So in that sense, affect is the capacity to be affected. It's the way that the world around us sort of seeps into us and tints us and shapes our subjectivity. There's another sense of affect that is more closely associated, I would say, with um, someone like Henri Bergson, the uh, French philosopher, or, or Gilles Deleuze, another French philosopher who really liked Bergson, also liked Spinoza. Um, but that sense of affect is more metaphysical. It sees affect as something that is outside of the realm of structure. So affect is potential. Affect is that which has not yet been actualized as a something. Um, and that has implications for thinking about consciousness. It also has implications for thinking about reality, the nature of reality. Um, and that's a, a meaningfully different way of understanding affect compared to the Spinoza sense of affect. Then there's another sense of affect that I think also needs to be part of the conversation, which is more closely associated, I would say, with queer theory and with feminism um, and also has more bridges into the field of psychology. This is partly because of uh, queer theorist uh, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, who got very interested in a certain kind of post psychoanalytic psychology at a certain point in her career. And that sense of affect is much closer to the way that we, in a kind of ordinary way, would use the word emotion. Um, she is very comfortable talking about affect as being shame. But you wouldn't, if you were using the Spinoza perspective, the Spinoza definition of affect, or the Bergson definition of affect, it wouldn't make sense to talk about shame as being an affect. So that, that's, and, and there are other definitions of affect in circulation, but that's partly why it's sort of a difficult field to crack. So, yeah, it means many things, because that's one of the things I was wondering is, you know, uh, for our listeners, like, is affect a fancy academic way of saying emotion? But it, it, it can be quite different, eh? Like it can be more than that. Is that right? Is it something you feel? Is affect just something you feel? I think that within affect theory, if you clump all of these perspectives together and you say all of these things are affect theory, then that's a debate whether affect is something that you can feel. My, I mean, just to put my cards on the table, my sympathies tend to run most towards that latter category. I'm most interested in a version of affect that is pretty much a synonym with the word emotion. To me, that's just the, that's the most productive way that you can put affect into 
uh, the field. Um, not to dismiss other work that's being done, um, but I have found that to be the most useful way to uh, think about affect. I will say though that if there's a difference between affect and emotion, um, it seems to me the most useful way to think about that is that affect is kind of the micro and emotion is the macro. So you might have a kind of ambient sense that you are sad. You might have, I, I sort of think of it as like, it's the difference between droplets and a cloud. Like if you've got some like sad droplets hovering around you, you can kind of feel that, but it hasn't quite gotten to the point where if somebody said to you, how are you doing? You would say, I'm sad. But if enough of those droplets accumulate, then you get to this point where yes, you're sad and you know you're sad. Um, people who interact with you know that you're sad. That's, that's sort of like affect is micro, emotion is macro is I think the most interesting way about thinking about the difference. But I also think that it's in my own writing, I often use the word synonymous. Uh, okay, and you talk about rational actor theory. Uh, what is rational actor theory and how does affect theory sort of challenge that? Yeah, so uh, I would say rational actor theory is a perspective that comes out of the social sciences that basically says when you put a series of options in front of a human being, then that actor will always choose the option that is going to provide the most benefit for them. So this is a very powerful tool within economics, particularly right. within libertarian economics. People will say that um, when given a series of choices, um, an actor will always seek to maximize their own benefit. That's rational actor theory in a nutshell. The affect theory picture comes along and complicates this because affect theory will say, well, an actor is not really one thing. An actor is a kind of effect of all of these different affects, all of these different emotions make us into the kind of choosing being that we are. So what that means is that we don't necessarily know what we want and we don't necessarily choose what is obviously best for us. So this is um, the puzzle that lots of uh, liberal economists will have when they think about voting. And they will become very confused when they see voters voting against what they perceive as their economic interests. That's the rational actor theory or rational choice theory. Um, whereas affect theory comes along and says, look, people are not just, people are not just dollar signs. Like people are not just economic engines that will always seek to maximize their wealth. People are complicated and they have all of these different priorities that jostle together. And that's what makes predicting rational choices a very difficult proposition. Right. They're sometimes doing something uh, because it feels right, or maybe it's even below the level of consciousness sometimes. Is that, is that sort of right? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, you have this wonderful terminology in the book. You talk about humans as kind of barometers uh, and you say quivering antennas. Um, and I'm thinking about what you just said. It sounds like, you know, the that affect is, um, it's like we search it out. It's like, uh, like it's not rational, right? You're like, you're, you're right. desiring it. Is that fair? Definitely, yeah. And that's why something like solitary confinement is so punishing. Sure, yeah. Um, so I use the example of solitary confinement um, in the book as a way of thinking about uh, as a way of thinking about what it means to be an affective creature, um, because solitary confinement is basically legal torture. It's basically a torture mechanism, but it doesn't look like torture. It doesn't look like you know broken bones or all of these other horrible things that we right. associate with torture. Instead, it looks very peaceful. It looks very quiet. But actually what's happening in the condition of solitary confinement is you are torturing affect. You are preventing people from um, having avenues of feeling things around them. Um, and that I think is from a kind of liberal rational choice theory perspective, there isn't actually any way of understanding mm. why solitary confinement is torture. Like not just boring, but torture. Why right. would it be torture if all you have to do in, in a situation like that is not choose? You're, you're fed, you're clothed, you're safe. Why, why is that torture? But from the ethic theory perspective, 
because we're we're pulled by our desires into the world around us, being cut off from the uh, being cut off from the world is actually incredibly painful. Uh, you know, Donovan, we're doing this mere days after the Trump crowd, um, supporting crowd, stormed the Capitol building. Uh, what, what would uh, Affect Theory say about that act, that crowd, or even Trumpism in the past five years? Yeah, I mean, I think Affect Theory has a lot to say about Trumpism. Um, in a lot of ways, I mean, I think Trump has become a sort of amazing case study for explaining just how powerful these affective dimensions of politics actually are. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a lot to be said about it, but I guess one thing that I was really struck by is the way that Trump uses language, but also the way that he doesn't use language. Um, so for instance, in Trump's speech uh, during uh, immediately before the um, attack on the Capitol buildings. Um, Trump at, never, at, one, at, at no point actually says, go and attack the Capitol buildings. And yet he's able to indicate to his followers that that's what he wants them to do. He's doing something that is, he's, he's transmitting on these channels that are not strictly linguistic, that are, you know, you couldn't just sort of do an anatomy of Trump's speech and be like, this is the moment where he told them to do X. And that's also partly what shields him so effectively. Um, he always he's he's a master of holding on to plausible deniability because he doesn't come out and say what he wants people to do, and yet he's guiding them. And we all know that he's guiding them. And I think that um, the humanities, and I would also say journalism, um, have a very hard time with this. They have a very hard time pointing to these moments where Trump has done X in order to uh, conduct his followers to do a certain things. And that's because they're just looking at the words that he uses rather than all of these other techniques that he's using to move affects around in groups. That's really great. This reminds me on your page, you've got a description of affect theory, a very short one. And you describe how it comes from a, one of the early theorists was Tompkins, who was a, Sylvan Tompkins, who was a playwright. And you have this great line where you, you talk about an actor and you say, the actor's tool isn't the script. The actor's tool is their body. Right. Um, that, that's kind of Trump, right? It's not just the words, it's the way you say it, the inflection, the, the way you're holding your jaw, the sneer, it's all of that, right? Absolutely. There was a, uh, back like in the very early days of the Trump administration, I want to say it was before his first address to Congress, Trump was caught on camera sitting in his limousine, um, which had, or an SUV or whatever, um, and he turned the light on inside the SUV. And so you could see him through the window of the car and he had his speech on a piece of paper in front of him and he was practicing his speech. But instead of practicing the words, he was practicing facial expressions. He was literally, uh, he was literally considering the facial expressions that he was going to use to amplify these different segments of his speech. And I think that we in the humanities have done an incredibly poor job of tracking things like facial expressions. He knows that facial expressions are part of his power. And every actor knows that facial expressions are part of what makes them good at their job. And I mean, there's a way in, and there's a reason why so many actors have been successful politicians. Reagan was an incredibly successful politician for this reason, because he came out of acting or uh, Schwarzenegger or arguably Trump himself is an actor that that was his job um, prior to becoming president. Um, and I think it's for exactly this reason that they, they've got this feel for how to do more than just the words on the page. That reminds me so much that, you know, he uh, he watches himself with the, the volume off and he makes sure too that he he always keeps his chin up, that if someone challenges him, you don't look down, you, you look up, that it's strong and stuff like that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's very fascinating. Um, uh, you've written about, uh, so beyond last week, uh, you've written about Trump's appeal to his, uh, you know, to his supporters and you've talked about it in terms of shame and dignity. Can you say a bit about that? Yeah. Um, I guess from my perspective, one of the ways of understanding how Trump 
ism has become as prominent as it is, is because Trump is a sort of master of redistributing shame and dignity. Trump makes the people who follow him feel proud. And he makes the people who are not with him feel degraded. And it's, it's, it's a very simple but incredibly effective technique for building a political power base. And part of the reason why po Trump's political power base is as solid as it is, it's not as big as he would like it to be. It wasn't big enough for him to win the election. Um, but part of the reason why Trump's political power base is as rock solid as it is um, is because he has done an incredibly good job of making them feel like they have dignity as long as they are with him and that the people who are not with them are base, that they are uh, disgusting. And that's, that's also where Trump intersects with race. Like he, he's got this kind of, you know, he doesn't use the words. He doesn't have to talk about whiteness, but he creates this, he creates this sort of canopy over the people who are around him and that becomes a sort of proxy for whiteness. Um, and he builds those people up as he breaks everyone else down. Hmm. Uh, yeah, you have this great line uh, somewhere in the book where you talk about, you know, uh, we tend to think that affect is used for ideological ends, right? And, and I, um, but that it's the other way around, as you think, that, that sometimes ideology is serving affect. And I was thinking about anti-Black racism when we tend to think, you know, you generate the hate so that you can, um, keep certain people out of certain jobs and therefore more money comes to you. But I hear you saying there's more than that. It's just the feeling sort of of, of what? Of superiority or, or what would you call that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's a lot of things. Um, I don't in any way want to diminish the economic motive and the economic power behind anti-Black racism. Um, but I also think that when we reduce anti-Black racism to economic motives, we miss partly what is what's so what's so uh, why it's been able to hang on in such a vigorous way for so long, and why it has such a powerful immune response. Like when you push on it, it pushes back, and, and in a lot of ways, that's what we're seeing with uh, with Trump. So I guess the argument that I would make is that. Um, I'm very influenced by a critical race theorist named Sharon Patricia Holland. Uh, she writes a book called The Erotic Life of Racism, where she makes the argument that we need to see racism not just as a sort of set of intellectual errors, but as something that also brings pleasure along with it. There's this kind of pleasure of forming your group and then pushing everybody else um, to the outside of it. Um, and I remember reading this book um, shortly after I finished my PhD and it just, it, it just blew me out of the water. Like, I, I feel like I'm still in a way reeling from reading that book, um, however many years ago, um, because it was just such a powerful and compelling way of looking at things. Um, and it helps to explain why racism is so hard to erase, why it's so hard to move on from this uh, structure of white supremacy um, that is doing so much damage. Um, and it's because there's this pleasure to it. And that I think is sort of what Trump is a master of. Trump is a kind of master, uh, he's, he's like uh, an impresario of these feelings, these racialized feelings of creating an us and then pushing the them outside of it. That's really good, the erotics of hate. Hmm. The pleasure. Uh, what, uh, I want to get back to religion, but one more po political question. Uh, you know, when I watch American debates, I'll, I'll, I'll see the uh, Democrats talk about policy X and Y and Z, and the Republican often will come on and go socialism, socialism, socialism. Do you think, do you think Democrats aren't as good at affect as the Republicans? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a uh... That's definitely like a conversation that a lot of people in political theory who are attuned to affect are having. Um, I think that's a tricky question because I think that a lot of people who might be inclined to vote for Democrats, whether or not they see themselves as Democrats or not, um, feel like they are constantly losing. But it's important to keep in front of us if we're thinking about the American political scene, um, 
that Republicans have lost, what would we say, seven of the seven eight. Seven of eight, yeah. Uh, they've lost the popular vote in seven of the eight, uh, seven of the eight last elections. Um, so, I mean, who's winning? Like, who's who's got like the who's got the edge in terms of thinking about affect when you look at a data point like that? Um, so, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of like dodge your question, but I guess what I would want to say is that. I am not suggesting that Trump has come up with this secret sauce, which is to add affect to things um, and thereby to build political power. I think that all of the different political factions are using affect. They're all finding ways to uh, make people feel things. And that's what brings them on board. And the thing is that policy can be affective. That's sometimes, I mean, mm. you can have policies that are sort of sprawling and complicated, um, like Obamacare is a really good example of this. And it's hard for people to feel things about that. But somebody like Senator Sanders is a master of presenting visionary policy proposals that make people feel things. And he's built an enormous amount of political power um, by presenting visionary po uh, political policy proposals. So I don't want to say that there is affective politics, which is what Trump is doing and would be bad. And then there's non-affective politics. I think all of our politics is affective. Um, yes. The point is to understand how they're differently affective, which brings us back to this question of, you know, what are the different emotional contours that are being mobilized in these political structures? That's really good. And Donovan, is, like, is affect always there? Like, how about when I'm, like, I can see it, of course, in politics or in a religious setting. How about right. when I'm sitting in my office and I'm reading an academic text? Like, at that point, am I just getting information? Or do you think there's affect when I'm sitting here at my, my desk reading, you know, reading uh, some author I could throw out? Totally. It's such a key question. I mean, because it's so hard for us to think beyond a kind of thinking feeling divide like that thinking feeling divide is like you know it's it's the original sin of western philosophy it's just so hard for us to get beyond that um but honestly i would make the argument that you are feeling things when you're sitting there reading an academic article you might feel like it's just work but there's a reason why you're working and not doing something else um especially if you don't have somebody looking over your shoulder like why are you even there if you're you're not enjoying it but you're there because you're feeling a certain way about being there and you'd feel a certain way about the alternative. Like if you just, you know, played hooky for the day, um, that would make you feel a certain way. You might feel exhilarated at first, but then you'd feel ashamed. And then you might feel scared because maybe you would feel like your job was in jeopardy. So I would say that, yes, there is a kind of emotional, um, there is a kind of emotional nexus that is, uh, that is keeping you in your seat, even when you're reading a book. But I mean, I would also add that books are very exciting and ideas are very exciting. And it's, it's hard for us to say that, like the grammar of that doesn't work if you start from a feeling thinking divide. But I would make the argument that affect really is operative, even at the level of thinking and talking and even reasoning things out with people. That's great. Okay, so let's turn uh, let's turn to religious language. Uh, in your book, you cite Bruno Latour, uh, who talks about religious language and says we should think about religious language as love talk. Why did you grab onto that? Yeah, well, I mean, I want to clarify that because my starting point would be that religion is not fundamentally special. Religion is not something that is um, separate from other things that we do in culture. If the word religion ceased to exist and everything that we now call religion was absorbed into a more general um, field that we just call culture, I do not really think that we would be losing anything. I don't think that it would be a significant loss. So the technical word for this in religious studies is the language of sui generis religion, which right. means religion in a class by itself. I don't subscribe to the idea that religion is sui generis, that it's in a class by itself. I think that it's continuous with other things that we do um, as experiencing bodies. So let me just sort of preface my answer by saying that. Okay. Um, however, the reason why I picked on that uh, line from Latour, which I think is really interesting, is because in that particular essay, 
he is pushing back on the idea that religion is about belief, that religion is fundamentally about um, a belief in distant things. And instead, he's making the argument that religion is a kind of a tool, a technology for helping us to feel things, um, which I think is what we would say about a lot of culture generally. Um, that to me seemed like the insight that he was offering in that essay. It was a way of countering the idea that religion is fundamentally about belief in faraway things. And I guess too, like uh, I'm thinking in religious services, how often we we sing the lines or we we say, you know, we believe in this or, um, and, you know, we already know this, so why are we doing it? But it, but there's an affect there, I guess, about doing it with a group or how, how would you interpret that? I, I think so. Absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, I think there's a reason why so much of religion is about bringing people together. Um, I mean, there's, there's a whole, there's, there's probably a distinct feeling of being together with other people. There's also an amplifying feeling, but I also don't think it's impossible to be religious on your own. Uh, I mean, people have all kinds of ways of being religious on their own. Um, to me, there's not a kind of, there's not a hard line between things that we do socially and things that we do individually. And Donovan, like to push back, like how about, because there'll be some people listening who say, but look, at the end of the day, the key thing about my religion is that I believe X and Y and that it is true. What what would you say to that? Uh, is there a, I don't know, are, 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 are we missing something or, but there is that sense that it's true. So how would you respond to that? I feel like the people who, really see their religion as being about a set of beliefs that they have means tested and found them to be true is a very small group of people. And most of them are professional philosophers who are in universities. I think the vast majority of people um, find religion meaningful, but in a kind of emotional experiential way. Religion does all kinds of things for them um, that are emotional. Um, but I would also say, but at the same time, though, I mean, I think you're, you're raising a very important point. There are a lot of uh, moments when we look at the archive of religion where professing belief, confessing, um, is an incredibly important thing. But I think that's also affective. I think that people uh, profess faith in order to become part of a group they profess faith in order to differentiate them, themselves from other people that they don't like. Um, they profess faith uh, because it makes them feel like they're in contact with something profound, something uh, transcendent. Um, and the act of professing becomes, becomes what? Like the, the sort of door that you open in order to feel that proximity to this powerful thing. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't disagree with you. Like, I think there is a lot of affective power in professions of faith. Um, but in addition to being sort of a minoritarian position, I think that that too is something that we can see as driven by feeling rather than independent of feeling. This is, again, breaking down that barrier between thinking and feeling, right? The one, they're, they're, they're two sides of the same coin or something. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that language of love talk, like I was thinking about conversion um, as well. Like, is it, can we think about conversion as almost like a, um, I'm thinking of the word seduction, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but sure, is that, I don't know, what do you think about that? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, what, I don't know. I mean, you think about strategies for conversion that religious groups that are interested in conversion um, have practiced over the course of history. And it very often revolves around pleasure. It revolves around making people feel things. Um, it revolves around bringing them to meals. The, the joke with evangelicals is that you convert people with pizza and basketball, that you bring mm -hmm. them into your youth group and then you give them the pizza and the basketball and that's, a, that's, that's one of the avenues that you use to bring people into your community. Um, and I think that, like we were talking about before, the, the fact of being in a group with other people is very emotionally powerful. This is, you know, I think Durkheim's concept of collective effervescence, I think that he's naming something that is very vividly real. It's not necessarily the be all and end all that he makes it out to be. But I think that the feeling that we get when we're in groups of people 
is an incredibly powerful feeling. And very often I think that pulling somebody towards the horizon of conversion, whether they start with no faith and then you, uh, they end up with uh, a membership in a particular religious group, or if they're switching between religious groups, I think very often that's driven by this sort of gravitational field of feeling, of making them feel a certain way about the new group. That's really good. You know, that's funny. I was reading something today completely unrelated to this podcast. It had to do with political divisions. And it was a bit about the science of how you persuade someone. And the, the subheading was friendship, not facts, right? It's yeah. all about mm-hmm. have them over for dinner. <laughs> Don't worry about your facts. Create, create a bond. That's really good. I think that's so true. And I think, you know, I mean, I would add to that. I think one of the problems that we have in liberal democracy generally is that we don't have a very well-developed theory of how persuasion works. And in a lot of ways, I mean, the vision of liberal democracy is a kind of public sphere where everybody enters as a kind of a, what would you say, like a a sort of blank... um, Like a rational actor almost, right? Like a rational actor, exactly. Like a, a faceless person with no friends and no relationships. And the ideas are what drives the conversation, but that misses all of these other elements that are part of, uh, that are part of persuasion and that are part of um, changing people's minds within relationships rather than in a neutral public sphere. Uh, Donovan, your, your current work has to do with affect with respect to uh, the secular and I think with science. Um, I don't know much about that. What, what can you say about that? What, is, what does affect have to say about science or about the secular? Yeah, I mean, I think it. Uh, I think we've already started to talk about a lot of this, um, but I guess the argument that I'm making in this new project um, is to say that we need to take affect very seriously for thinking about rationality. Rationality is not, in the affect theory picture, um, something that kind of stand on its stands on its own and kind of has a calculator in its hand and makes decisions um, based on some a set of neutral, transcendent objective criteria, the affect theory picture would say that rationality is something that is made by feeling. And the way that we think through the world is shaped by the way that we feel. Um, And I think that we can use that to better understand secularism. I think that secularism, uh, if you understand it as a kind of a kind of uh, a notion that religion is um, uh, religion is superstition, that religion is backwards, and gradually it's going to be replaced by this empire of reason that will be the same for everyone. That misses the fact that reason is shaped by the way that we feel, which means it's also very local. It's not, you know, there isn't necessarily a sort of universal rationality that everybody shares with the same uh, goals and criteria. So my perspective is that we need to very seriously rethink uh, what we mean by secularism. And I'm, I'm building on secularism scholars like uh, Sabah Mahmoud or Talal Asad here um, and really trying to bring affect into the picture of secularism. Donovan, you, this has been great. You've helped us think about, uh, about religion, about politics, and really even the way that we feel thoughts and think feelings. So uh, uh, this has been great. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Brian. This was a lot of fun. Thanks everyone for listening. You can get Donovan's book, Religious Affects, Animality, Evolution, and Power, published by Duke University in 2015. Uh, And if you want to check me out, I'm at religionsgeek.com or you can follow me at Twitter at religionsgeek. Thanks so much.